So um, let's um, start off with why hopefully you guys are here, what can, you can hope to get out of this, and then we'll talk about what you will actually be able to get out of this. So um, one is, you know, you may want to simply understand how Android works. Specifically, you want to understand, for example, how intents or messenger or content providers or system services or access to system services or security or how lifecycle callbacks are implemented. As you will see, all of that actually happens over Binder. You may simply want to understand how Binder itself works because it's an interesting IPC framework. Um, or you simply want to take advantage of Binder and um, essentially have a more direct IPC uh, um, essentially connectivity across a suite of applications you guys may be creating. Um, and you know, you may have just have nothing better to do, so that's why you're here. But hopefully, um, we'll go over some of these objectives. So we'll go over what Binder is, what IPC is, very briefly, advantages of Binder compared to other forms of IPC, um, comparing Binder to other forms like, actually on Android forms like Intents and Content Providers and Messenger and whatnot, um, some brief intro to Binder terminology because we'll kind of come across it over, over, and, over and over again, the communication model, the discovery model, AIDL, a kind of a way of describing services, as you will see how the object reference mapping works, uh, we're going to talk about Binder through essentially an example application or, or client ser service applications. We're going to talk about asynchronous nature of Binder, uh, memory sharing, some limitations with respect to Binder, uh, security. Um, we'll talk about some other features like death notification and uh, reporting as well. Now, just a little bit, of, actually, before I talk about, you know, who am I and why I'm qualified to talk about this, I just wanted to tell you that there's a lot of information and Binder in particular is one of those topics where we can go very, very wide or we can go very, very deep. And unfortunately, we have an hour and what, 15 minutes. So um, we're not gonna be able to you know, do both. Well, I'll do my best to go over everything. Now, I'm not gonna expect to have you guys read all the slides or to even necessarily go over every point on all those slides. So think of slides as a, as a resource that you can go through later on on your own. Um, but let's focus on more important concepts and hopefully we'll touch upon the ones that are in fact more important and maybe you know, not necessarily touch upon everything that's in the, you know, are in the slides. So in terms of who I am, I go by name of Alexander Gargenta or, or nickname of Sasha. I happen to be a, one of the Android instructors at Maracana. Uh, we focus on open source training, but I specifically focus on Android or even more so internals of Android, and as you can imagine, Android Binder is a very you know, core part of that. I also happen to run the San Francisco Android User Group, Java User Group. I also uh, co-host or co-founded the HTML5 User Group. I speak at other conferences and whatnot. Um, I used to actually do a lot of enterprise Java development pre prior to coming to Android, um, but I also worked on you know, old school mobile technologies like you know, WAP push and MMS and SMS and that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's about me. Now, what is Binder? I'll just kind of go over the basics and then we'll uh, talk about why we need it. So Binder itself is essentially a, think of it as a framework. It's not just an IPC you know, mechanism, but it's more of a framework um, that enables us to develop essentially an object-oriented OS-like experience. Now, we're not talking about an object-oriented kernel we're talking about enabling essentially an object-oriented service environment on top of traditional kernels like Linux. And as you will see, Binder itself is obviously split across the entire stack. You know, the core of it being the Binder driver is in the kernel itself. And traditionally, well, actually I should just tell you a little bit about you know, the history of Binder. Um, Binder comes from OpenBinder, which was originally designed at VOS. It was supposed to be part of their, you know, next generation release back in the day. Um, it, BOS was then, or Bing was acquired by Palm. Uh, it was then essentially firstly implemented as part of the Cobalt release of Palm uh, on first their microkernel, then Palm switched to Linux. It, was, it, it got ported to Linux as well. Um, and at some point, 2005-ish, um, Diane uh, Hagborn was basically, he, she was one of the uh, key contributors to Binder. She, she was, snapped by, by Google and um, kind of brought into the Android team. And so Android, uh, the very first release of Android was in fact based on open binder, or I should say the very first bring up of Android, but then very quickly it got rewritten from scratch uh, 
to essentially suit the Android needs. Now, open binder and binder are somewhat related in terms of the concepts at the end of the terminology, but they are distinct. Think of open binder as a fork of open binder, and open binder is more or less dead in terms of future you know, development. Now, why we're here is because Binder is essential to Android, as you will see. And in fact, if you focus on just this image over here, let me actually zoom in on like this. These are, by the way, SVG graphics. So if you're, you're trying to access this over, say, IE, you may have trouble. Um, so this basically gives you an idea that in Android, we have the kernel at the bottom, we have a bunch of daemons like service manager, media server, system server, surface flinger, you might have heard of these things, and then you have applications. In fact, these, as you can see right from this diagram, all run in separate processes. And that was one of the you know, core concepts behind, in fact, IPC on Android. And because of that, Binder is essentially used as a transport mechanism to enable this sort of architecture. And we'll see exactly why this is needed. So what is IPC? So IPC is essentially a you know, framework for exchange of signals, if, if you will, and data across multiple processes or threads, but in this case, we're gonna focus on processes. It is really used for message passing, synchronization, sharing memory, or you know, essentially RPC or remote procedure calls. Um, now, we specifically, what we get out of IPC, we get information sharing, we get uh, modularization of our code, we get isolation of the processes, which leads to better security models, better stability models, and whatnot. Um, because essentially every process runs in its own sandbox memory space, so if you were to misbehave or say die because it's poorly written, it doesn't affect anything else in the system. Um, there are many IPC options that we could have been using on Android, like for example, files, you know, signals, sockets, you know, buying Unix sockets or TCP IP sockets, pipes, um, shared memory, semaphores, message passing, like message queues, B D bus. Um, and then of course on Android, we use intents as a form of IPC. Uh, as you will see, they themselves are based on, on binder and then the binder, right? So Android, as you will see, mostly, most of it is, most of IPC is based on binder with some of the low level IPC being based on sockets. Now, why specifically Binder? So, basically, Android apps, Android from the get-go was designed so that its apps and applications, uh, sorry, services, I should say, system services, run in separate processes. And this, as I mentioned before, buys us security, buys us stability, buys us memory management. So, for example, as you guys know, in Android, if an application is no longer needed, what happens, it's literally, its process is killed. So we can't really do that if that application is embedded inside of another process. We cannot just easily kill it, whereas the Linux takes care of all the cleanup for us. Um, so by stability, as I already mentioned, if an application misbehaves, it doesn't affect anything else, and that also is important from a security perspective. Now, IPC is a great way of providing these features, but the problem is that traditional System 5-based or POSIX based IPC isn't supported on Android. So there's no support for semaphores, shared memory, uh, message queues, and so on forth. Now, why not? Well, one of, the, one of the actual reasons is something you can read more about here. In fact, you can see a proof of concept. The System 5 IPC is prone to resource leakage in case applications don't properly clean off clean up after themselves. So specifically, if an application, two, say two applications were to share a semaphore and one of them were to get killed, the other one may in fact end up being dead blocked or end up, you know, the OS resource may in fact end up being just left in the kernel and never cleaned up. Um, and in Android, it's actually not uncommon for an application to die without cleaning up after itself. In fact, that is one of the models that Android uses to essentially manage memory, right? The low memory killer environment. So that is, you know, that alone gives us a reason to think of a different solution than the traditional IPC mechanisms that are available. So how is Binder better? Well, one of the features of Binder is that it has object reference counting built into it and something called death notification. So these two features plus others make it very unsuitable to environments where things just go boom for no particular reason. Basically they die without their knowledge. So this makes Binder basically, you know, address the very concerns of System 5 based IPC. In addition to that, we have a much neater programming model. So some, some people refer to it as thread migration, meaning when you are invoking an operation in a remote object, the, you know, in the ideal world, it will appear to you as the programmer that that object is local. You will not know that essentially the, the operation may execute elsewhere. 
So it will, you will not even feel this being so much an IPC. You'll just get a reference, you'll invoke a method, and magically things work. As opposed to you having to worry about threading, having to worry about low-level file descriptors, messaging, you know, uh, buffers, and whatnot. So it'll appear like your thread jumps to another process and continues executing your, you know, the method you invoked on the other process. This is very, very important. Binder actually makes this possible through a couple of things. For example, it, can, it man manages thread pools for us on the remote side. So the remote side actually is implemented just by the virtual callbacks as opposed to having to manage any threading or synchronization or anything like that. And the remote methods essentially feel, like I said, they're local. Um, that said, Android also supports, or Binder also supports what's, what's known as asynchronous operations where it'll invoke an operation and then just simply return right away without waiting for the remote site to complete. And this is actually very important in some cases. A um, couple of other features, we get automatic, um, essentially, ad, uh, I should, I should say information about the sender is automatically embedded in the messages sent between the parties communicating. So the receiver can actually use this information to say query who the sender is and based on that decide whether or not the sender should be permitted to execute the operation they want to execute. And this is actually very core to how Android does security, as we will see later on. Um, also, we also have the support for um, unique object mapping across process boundaries. So for example, if I go and create, you know, um, create an object that I want others to be able to rem remotely reference, I can pass that object to some other process. That other process can then pass that object or that reference to yet another process, and that other process can still use it. That object is essentially, the reference to that, ob that object is unique, unique across the entire system. Okay? And Android's binder driver takes care of rewriting essentially as you will see the references as necessary to make local references become remote references when they cross object or process boundaries. Um, we'll talk about this idea of tokens and whatnot later on. Um, Binder also supports this idea of sending file descriptors across process boundaries. And this is actually very important on Android to avoid memory copies. So for example, on Android, when you're, let's say, uh, displaying something to screen, to a back buffer, you're not writing to your own memory and then giving that memory to Surface Flinger so by copying, so Surface Flinger can go and display it onto the, on the essentially, the, fr the frame buffer. Rather, the Surface Flinger gives you a buffer as a file descriptor reference that you can memory map, you write into it, and then you signal to the Surface Flinger that you're done. Surface Flinger takes that buffer and says, okay, this represents the, byte, the bits you want me to display on the screen, let's go and do it. Um, all along, you essentially are writing into memory that is managed by the kernel or even accessible to the, the to, to display stack directly. So this is very important because without it, we would have ha had to essentially copy memory around. And Binder makes this possible. Uh, also supports the uh, invocation, essentially very much, I should actually go back a few things. Uh, it has a very simple AIDL based language or interface definition language to make it fairly simple to describe services to their clients. It has built-in support for marshalling of very common data types, so you don't have to worry about how, how do I write an int? Should it be you know, this byte order or that byte order? You just don't think about these things. Or how do I write strings across a process, a process boundaries? Um, one thing I should mention is that Binder doesn't favor, a, the Binder driver, as you will see, doesn't favor languages. So you can, your, your clients and or your services could be written in Java, C, or C++. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the semantics are the same. Um, there's built-in support for many common data types. The transaction model is basically uh, simplified by auto-generated stops and proxies that I'll show you later on. It supports automatic recursion across processes. So you can process A can call process B, which can then call back into process A, and they can essentially do recursion. And uh, the, if a process A were to call what it thinks is a remote object, but it happens to live inside a process A, so it's not remote, binder short circuits the whole thing, and it just essentially calls it you know, locally. So there's absolutely zero overhead. Now, that said, binder is not an RPC. It's not about remote procedure calls. So it does not escape the system on which it is running. So the actual transactions are limited to the same OS. Um, and it is client service based, uh, messaging uh, oriented. So basically, there's, it's not very well suited, suited for things like streaming. Um, and it's not defined by any sort of APIs like POSIX or standards. So that gives you hopefully an idea of why Binder. Now, you might have been already doing IPC before, and you may think, well, why do I care about Binder? I already know how to use Intense. And in fact, Intense content providers 
are a simple form of IPC on Android that most applications are encouraged to use anyway. So for example, if you consider this diagram over here, you could have an application A with say a broadcast receiver, application B with an activity, application C with another activity, uh, some application with a service, another application with a content provider. And so these in fact can talk to each other using either intents and or um, essentially content providers are more direct access uh, to, the, to, to the other uh, uh, components. Now, isn't this IPC? And it, and it is. In fact, this is, like I said, the, the recommended approach for most applications. But it is somewhat limited. Um, specifically, it's not very object-oriented. You're sending intents. Intent is just a payload that contains the information about wh what you want to have done and kind of the, you know, the parameters of, the, of that intention. Um, it is very asynchronous. So basically, when you're making calls to remote side, you are you don't really you know you don't know when and, or even if that call is going to be uh, uh, completed. And it's kind of the, the way you use it is slightly clunky. Now, content providers are more synchronous, but the problem with content providers is they do not you know they have a fixed API, so you're really limited to to the model that they, they force on you. Um, ultimately, all of it is based on, on binder. So all of the communication in Android, it is intent and or content provider based. Underneath the hood, if you were to look through the Android source code, you actually see that ultimately all boils down to binder. Um, so why do we care about binder? If this is available, well, if you want to have low latency, you know, synchronous execution where you can, you get to define your own APIs, you're not constrained by essentially the, the clunkiness of intents and or content providers, if that's not what, you know, essentially maps well to what you're trying to do, then Binder is a more direct approach to IPC. That's why we're going to look at it. Now, in terms of how intents work, this is kind of, you know, just a sh you know, short example. So if, let's say you had an activity that wanted to do a product lookup, say by scanning a barcode, but it doesn't want to do the scanning of the barcode because it's a hard thing to do. Well, what it may do is create an intent and ask, for example, the Google uh, uh, barcode scanner to do the scanning. So it would create an intent, specify, you know, who's supposed to handle the intent, specify a parameter of the intent, send the intent, that intent goes to, say, the barcode scanning activity, which then goes and asks, you know, turns on the camera, that does whatever it needs to do. And then at some point in the future, it goes and saves the contents of, say, the, you know, the barcode that's, that was scanned into some result. Then the, that content, the result, comes back via an asynchronous callback. And if the code and the result are what the application or the client expects, the client can pick up the, you know, essential response data again from this coming, you know, this intent, and then say do an actual IPC lookup or something like that, or UPC lookup. So this works, but it's somewhat clunky. Like I said, it's asynchronous. The APIs are somewhat, you know, not always intuitive to use. Another form of IPC on Android that you might have come across, which also works with, the, with intents, is this idea of a messenger. So a messenger basically is a reference to a handler in a remote object. So you guys are hopefully familiar with handlers. If you're not, you know, well, look them up. We're probably not going to have the time to go over it. But basically the idea is, is a handler is a, 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 a handle onto a message queue, which the local looper thread goes and reads from and processes messages to do something with them. So for example, let's say you wanted to build an application. It's probably better to just for me to explain it via an example. Say you had an application that wants to request a remote service, do a download of some, I don't know, some URLs and some data and then send it back, you know, progress information about how the data is being downloaded, right? So you want to get a stream of, of callbacks from the remote service as it's doing the download for you. Well, one way you can do this is, for example, to create an application that creates an intent, again intent, um, in the intent specify the URIs you want to have downloaded, and then create essentially a messenger which wraps a handler. The handler is where you're going to get your callbacks. So you then, let's say, start a service. What happens then is on the other side, this is the kind of the service, assuming in another process, you would handle that intent. Again, we're back to intent-based communication. And then what you can do is you can loop through all the URIs, presumably do the download. And when you download the URI, you can then go and get the messenger from the intent. So notice we just send the intent across process boundaries 
you know, using essentially uh, the simple IPC mechanism. Once you have that messenger, you can obtain messages, put the data you want, you know, to respond back to the client into that message, well, into a, bun into a bundle, then into a message, and then you send that message. Once that message is, oops, you send a message. Once that message is sent, on the other side, back in the client, the client essentially inside of its handler gets the message. It then extracts the data that it got and then presumably, let's say, updates a progress bar or does whatever something useful with that. So they're essentially same, you know, ultimately all of this is still based on binder and underneath the hood this completely works on binder, but it gives you a more synchronous you know, a communication channel. It's not quite synchronous because what happens is that when the messenger receives a message, it receives it on one thread, but it then drops it onto the message queue of the handler, through the handler, on another thread, the UI thread, where the message gets handled. So a lot of this, you know, a lot of decisions are, you know, taken away from you and you essentially, you know, just use the API and it fits your needs or it doesn't. But that's about all you have. Now, that's, those are the options if you don't want to use Pointer. Like those are abstractions of binder, if you will. Now, let's say we do want to use binder. You maybe you're sold on the idea of binder. We need to kind of go over, first of all, a few terms that we're gonna encounter for the rest of the talk. First of all, binder refer, binder itself refers to a lot of things. When I when I say binder, I oftentimes refer to the binder framework, which includes the binder driver which exists inside of the kernel and it's accessible through essentially an IOCTL-based API. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Um, the binder protocol, which is essentially how we communicate with the driver, an iBinder interface, which essentially defines the basic set of methods that you can invoke on any binder object, okay? AIDL, is a interface definition language, we'll talk about it in more detail in a moment, which allows us to define our business operations on top of the AIDL interface, because, sorry, the, the iBinder interface, because iBinder interface is very generic. We need the whole idea of using binders so we can define our own APIs. Binder objects are implementations or basic implementations of iBinder interfaces, but they don't have any business value. They don't actually do anything other than represent a remote object. Sometimes they're used as tokens to essentially define who the client is, and I'll show you why this is interesting. But on their own, they don't actually are not really meant for IPC per se because they don't really have any operations that we know of uh, by default. A binder token is essentially a handle onto a binder object. That's at least how we think of it. Binder service. The binder service is a binder object, except that it typically implements some sort of an AIDL-based, you know, interface. So it implements, you know, the business operations that we care about. That's what we actually want to use as clients most of the time. Binder client is the side actually wanting to make this binder invocation or this binder transaction. Uh, so it wants to take advantage of the services offered by the binder service. By the transaction is essentially, you can think of it as a method invocation. So every time we invoke a remote method, we're essentially submitting a what's known as a binder transaction, um, which can be synchronous or asynchronous. If it's synchronous, it comes back with a reply, as we will see. Parcels are basically the data structure that, um, that, that essentially contains our parameters that we send in binder transactions. And the, returns, and the return values we see from binder transactions. Um, as you will see at the end of the day, parcels are nothing more than glorified byte arrays with some metadata attached to them. Um, but they're very key to kind of how we send data across the binder channel. Marshalling is a mechanism of converting essentially, say, rich Java data types that you want to send to the other side to parcels so that they can be then boiled down to something that binder understands. And unmarshalling is the reverse process. You basically unflatten, you go, you go take a parcel, which is very generic, and you read from it the data and you reconstruct the original parameters that say the client wanted to send to the service. The proxy and stub are, in some cases, automatically generated specifically to help with partialing, sorry, with marshalling and unmarshalling as well as transaction invocation. That is something that will be auto-generated for us if we use Java, for example, because Java has slight, slight advantage over C++ in this department. And then finally, the context manager, or some of you might have seen it as a service manager, is a special binder object with a well-known address that helps us discover other binder objects. 
So that is the, the starting point for all binder communication, getting access to the service manager, as we will see. So those are just the terms. You have a question? Yeah. Sure. Does it end for the marshaling and unmarshaling? Yes. So we'll talk about custom marshaling and marshaling. So out of, the, out of the box, Binder supports marshaling and unmarshaling for many common data types, as you will see, like maps, lists, primitives, and whatnot. But if you had a custom data type, say some class of type foo, you could go and find how that class gets essentially marshaled and unmarshaled. Think of it as Java serialization. Can I rely on the available marshaling event, how we should complicate it, a map instead of map, that kind of structure that I'm sending to an email. So that marshaling is a label and type that. Right. So you can, it works across complicated data structures, as you said. However, you know, only if the, all of the elements of the data structure are in fact marshallable by default. Otherwise, you have to end up doing the marshalling yourself. We'll get to that when we discuss AIDL, but good questions. Now, we get to the kind of how does Binder actually work. Okay, so we understand that Binder is, hopefully, we understand that Binder is used everywhere. Okay, we really, the entire Android system would literally fall apart if we were to yank Binder away simply because all of the communication across all applications to system services um, and across you know, other application boundaries happens over binder. You wouldn't be able to draw a single pixel on the screen if there was no binder, right? So ultimately, when we talk about IPC, generally the client just wants to use a service, right? That's kind of what they want. You have a client process, you have a service process, each have their own threads. In this case, I'm kind of assuming Binder has one, sorry, the client has one thread, the service may have many, and you want to make, make a you know, remote, remote invocation. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you cannot, one process cannot just randomly invoke an operation in another process or read or write its memory. It's you know, out, of, out of its, essentially, it's, it's just not, not allowed simply because of the sandboxing that Linux kernel enforces. But the kernel can do this, which is why we need the Binder driver. So ultimately, this is what it typically looks like. You know, as you will see, a service that wants to be invoked by remote clients will generally make requests to the binder driver and wait, enter essentially a looping mode where it waits to receive requests from the binder driver. It will essentially create a pool of threads waiting for requests. <laughs> At that point, something like in the future, a client will submit a request. It will submit a request not to the service because it can't, but to the driver. The driver will somehow convert that request from what the client wanted to submit into what the service is expecting, propagate it over to the service. At that point, one of those threads, one of these threads that was blocked, will unblock, handle the request, produce some sort of a reply. The reply will be sent back to the binder. At that point, the thread will go back to waiting for the next request, and the reply will then go back to the client. Now, how does the client get the reply? Well, the original request that the client submitted was essentially submitted to the binder as a blocking IOCTL call. So all along, while the service was doing its thing, the client was waiting essentially on the binder driver. At the end of the request, the binder gets a response. At that point, the binder can or doesn't have to go back to the binder to do more things. But the service will go back to being blocked on the binder waiting for new requests. Now, because, and this kind of these three lines are meant to indicate that there could be more than you know, one thread. In fact, by default, binder supports up to 15 concurrent threads on every process. And so what that means is that there could be many concurrent clients talking to the service at the same time. And it will be up to the service to ensure that it's protecting its state from concurrent modification, right? So the same old threading you know, paradigms apply here as well. Now, the actual driver is exposed through a simple slash dev slash binder handle or node and has simple API, fairly simple for drivers, open release, pull, map, map, and memory map, flush, and more, most importantly, ioctal. So how does it actually work? Well, every, and this is the most important kind of command against the binder driver. Most of the commands are an ioctal. This is a special system call for communicating through drivers in Linux, where after you opened a binder driver, so you have a file descriptor, you pass to it this read-write command, and you pass to it a pointer to this memory, which is of type binder read-write. Binder read-write are two buffer arrays, 
um, of particular size. Well, the first one has its size defined, the second one will have its size defined, and you essentially pass that to the binder driver. What does the binder driver do? The binder driver goes through this write buffer, and it goes and reads from it the commands you are trying to submit to the binder driver. There could be many commands, like for example this, you know, you can say, um, I want to watch some object for that notification, or I want to increment a reference to something, or I want to decrement a reference, and so on and so on. But the last command generally is a transaction command. That's the, the one that you care about. That, well, everything you care about, but that's kind of the, the, the juicy one. When the, we'll talk about the transaction in a moment. When the binder returns from, say, it actually invoked a command on the other side, it got the reply from the other side, and now a binder comes back to you. So basically, the binder returns right here. At that point, the read buffer will contain a couple of things more bookkeeping commands for you to do work from the binder driver tells you to. And then the, the last part is a reply, either the reply to the original request you submitted, which was the, the thing over here, or another request for you to go and perform, because like I said, binder can support recursion across processes. Now, what's inside of these transactions? So every transaction, so that's, that's what, you know, that's the last request. So every transaction will contain a binder token. That is the thing that identifies which actual object inside of that remote process you want to talk to. And as you will see, each and every one of these binder tokens are unique across the entire system. Okay? So that essentially think of it as a, as a memory address of an object that you don't know which process it lives in. Okay? You then specify code. Now code is just an integer, but as you will see, code is essentially a um, a designator of the method you want the remote side to, to execute. Now, it is up to the client and service to agree on what code really represents. Binder doesn't care, but generally it's used to designate a method within that object. And it's just an integer starting from like one. Um, you then include the raw data buffer. That includes the data that you wanted to copy to the other side. In Binder, almost everything is sent by copy with a few exceptions as we'll talk about. And finally, the transaction will include your sender PID and UID. That's the information you actually can't change. That's kind of the information that gets automatically embedded by the driver. And this is in use for security reasons, as you will see. Got a question? Absolutely not. Right. Well, not even. So, so I, I thank you for bringing that up. I should have given this a little disclaimer. This part, you absolutely don't have to worry about. This is us talking to the kernel. This is me going down to the very, very, very low level of the binder driver, which you will never encounter unless you are actually working on some low-level code, which most of you, I'm assuming, are not. And this is more of an FYI. Feel free to ignore. If you want to snooze for five minutes, feel free to do so. Um, so, in fact, which brings me to the next interesting point, most low-level operations, so we talked about this raw data buffer. Well, we don't want to think in terms of raw data buffer. We actually want to think in terms of these parcels. We've now back to parcels. Think of a parcel as essentially a glorified byte array with metadata attached to it. And we actually don't want to know anything about these transactions because they're too low level. That's the part of the binder protocol. So most of the applications written in, C or user space codes written in C++ or C, uses what's known as lib binder. That's what does that work on its behalf. Now, it's in fact, in Android, even system services and definitely application developers really don't want to know anything about the binder, about the binder protocol. They, they didn't want to know anything about transactions and byte arrays, and they don't even want to know anything about libbinder. So in most cases, all of that work is abstracted away from us through something known as proxies and stubs. So now, what's a proxy? We kind of explained it already, but let me kind of explain it here in the context of this diagram. So when a client wants to talk to a service, what it typically does is submits a, an object-oriented request, a method invocation against what it thinks is a service, but in fact is a proxy. We'll see how the client gets fooled. The proxy then submits a request through JNI and libbinder to the binder driver. The binder driver submits a request, or returns, I should say, back to not the service, but to what's known as a stub. Stub receives that, receives that transaction from the binder driver. The stub goes and converts what was low-level binder request or transaction into what is now an object-oriented request 
excuse me, and then invokes it on the service. So basically, here we're object-oriented and here we're object-oriented, but in between, you know, right between these two lines, we're very, very low level, right? So proxy and the stub completely shield us from knowledge that this is actually even happening. When the service submits a response, that response is going to be an object, because you are object-oriented developers, and that object is not something you want to really even know how to write down into parcels, so the stub will invoke the appropriate methods to marshal the response back into what is essentially suitable for binder, the parcel. The binder driver will pass that object, or that, I should say, parcel, through the binder driver over into the proxy. The proxy will now unmarshal it, back into the object representation of what the service returned, and now the client gets the response. So basically, this over here is what the client cares about. This is what the service cares about. The, the, everything in between is completely, you can ignore, and you can still benefit from Binder. Now, one thing that I haven't explained is how does the client even get a reference to the service, right? So this is all very nice, but how do, how do I actually get started? I mean, this kind of implies that the client knows which service he wants to talk to. And this is where we use what's known as a context manager, or Binder calls it a context manager, but it actually is a user space process. It's called a service manager. So how does that work? Actually, sorry, I just jumped a little bit. I skipped one, one section. Let's, let me just go back one, one diagram before I talk about the service manager. In fact, most clients don't even want to know anything about services, especially when it comes to system services. For example, man, most of you, I would assume, has, have written applications that used Activity Manager, Prep Package Manager, Location Manager, Sensor Manager, Notification Manager, Search Manager, Download Manager, and the list goes on. Guess what? All of those managers live inside of another process. How did you talk to them? Through Binder. Did you know that you talked to them through Binder? Did you know of any proxies? Probably not. What you did is you said get system service and you got something would appear to do what you wanted to do. How does that work? Well, what happens is that when it comes to specialty system services, what you're actually given as a client developer, you're given what is known as a manager. So manager is actually a pro another proxy that completely shields you from the knowledge of binder. So you don't even have to know about the actual proxy and you don't have to know about the lookup of how you find the objects you want to talk to. And you don't have to worry about any low-level binder-specific exceptions. You just use it. To you, your location manager feels like a local object. And it is a local object, but what it's doing underneath the hood, it's invoking a proxy which is invoking, through binder, a remote service. So in Android, for most services, you will have manager and a service. So for example, there will be activity manager, activity manager service, location manager, location manager service. The service is the remote part. The manager is the local part that completely hides the binder complexity from you. Now, coming back to this idea of discovery, how do we find the thing that we want to talk to? Again, if you're just using system services, this is magically you know, hidden from you. But if you are, say, interested in how that works, well, let me kind of go through it. So when Binder is loaded early on by the kernel, the, the thing that it awaits is a registration from what it thinks or refers to as a context manager. Context manager basically is a special Binder object at position or handle zero, okay? Some known address. It's kind of like, think of it as 411. Everyone knows to dial 411 if they need to find out somebody's number, I guess. Who, who dials anymore? Because everyone else to go to Google, they need to search for something, right? It's burnt into our memory. That's how, you know, handle zero is burnt into everyone's memory. So what happens? Early on, this context manager, which in Android is called the system service, uh, sorry, service manager, it registers with binder. The binder says, okay, you're good to go. Then the context manager goes to binder and says, okay, I'm going to wait for you to give me requests. At some point in the future, our service comes and registers with the binder, oh, sorry, our service goes to the binder driver and says, hey, binder driver, I want to await requests from you. Then the service goes through its service manager proxy, which is yet another proxy, which is part of this, and it goes and says, hey, I want to find out where this manager is. Like, it actually wants to talk to it. So now the service becomes a client for this, and this context manager becomes a service. Why does it want to talk to it? Well, um, let's actually talk about how it gets it. Once it says I want to talk to it, this, the binder driver says, I know where that is. I'm going to give you address to the, to the service manager. 
Then the service goes over here and says, okay, I want to register with it. So it submits another request through Binder, which goes to service manager. Service manager says, I'm going to allow you to register your, you with me. And then the Binder driver goes and says back to the service proxy and back to service says, okay, I registered you. Why is this necessary? Well, this is how services essentially register, make themselves available to clients. So if any of you have ever done, whoops, sorry, uh, this ADB shell service list, you'll see that there's something like, in this case, 57 services that are registered by name of a particular implementation with a service manager. So it's just a table. Okay? This is how you basically discover your system services, starting from activity manager, which is needed for everything. The client that now wants to talk to the service, like the, ultimately the client wants to talk to this service. But how does he get to it? Well, the first thing it does, it says, okay, let's get to the binder and ask the binder to give us the address of the context manager. Binder rep replies, and then we go to the context manager, and then we say, okay, give us the address of the service. And then the, the call goes back to the client. At that point, the client has access to the remote service. Okay, so the context manager is this essentially a registration process that lives in between and handles all the lookups and, and storage of the, or you know, essentially the, these key value pairs. This is the, the thing I mentioned about the service list. Now, this diagram kind of goes into more detail on how this all works. I'm not gonna go through all these steps. You can kind of read it on your own. The idea is, you know, here's some sort of a service that you know, goes and registers, registers itself with the service context manager. It goes and basically starts listening on the binder driver. Here's a client. The client submits a request, goes to a proxy, to the lib binder, to the driver, wakes up the, you know, the other side lib binder, goes back to stuff, goes to service, service replies, and so on and so on. So it essentially just recaptures what we talked about. I'm not going to go over it again. Now, in terms of just making this feel a little more tangible, here's an example of how location works on Android. Some of you might have seen the slide before. I've kind of given this in my, one of my previous talks. This is essentially how location services work on Android. Here is an application, say, that wants to access, get access to its, say, last known location on the device. What it will do is it will ask the system for a location manager, a location service. And what it will get is a location manager. When it gets a location manager, well, the location manager needs to talk to the remote service. So what does the location manager do? The location manager goes down to the kernel and says, or to the driver and says, hey, driver, who is your context manager? And he gets reference to this. Then the location manager goes to the service manager and says, hey, service manager, where's the location service? And now the service manager replies. Now, how would a service manager know where the location service is? Well, inside of the system server, which got started early on during the system boot, one of the things that happened is that this thing called system server created, instantiated the location manager service. Location manager service is one of those binder services. What it did is it then basically initialized a bunch of its providers and other things which are you know, not important to us. But then the, look, the system server went to the service manager and says, hey, service manager, would you be so kind to remember this location service under the term location? That's it. Service manager says yes, and from this point forward, anyone can talk to the location service, assuming they know to search for it by location. And that's what you'll see over here. If I go back here and I, you know, search for location, you will see shows up somewhere here, location. There we go. So that is the location service. Okay. Anyway, so that's, I don't want to go into the details of the, how the rest of it works. It's not even important. I just kind of wanted to tell you that this is in fact how, you know, most services work. There are some exceptions. Some services use, you know, like for example, phone application uses Unix sockets to talk to the radio, um, radio daemon. But outside of a few exceptions like that, almost all communication happens over binary. Now, I mentioned that services, binder objects, are useless on their own. They need to have business operations. Well, how are those business, business operations methods described to the clients? Well, we use a language called AIDL. This language stands for Android Inference Definition Language, and it's similar to other IDLs you might have seen, like Corby and whatnot, but obviously simpler. It looks and feels like Java, for those of you that know Java, so it shouldn't really come as a surprise. 
So let's say you wanted to create a new service. You wanted to define a new service for the clients to use. You start off by thinking of what you want to call your service. And you typically you know, call it I, some name of the service, service dot AIDL, just a common naming convention. You stick that, serve, that file inside of the AI, sorry, inside of the source directory, and you package it like any other Java source. Inside of that, you go and define the service. Notice that the service has a package namespace, very much like Java would. It can import what appear to be Java classes, and it defines an interface like Java would. And inside of it has one or more methods, which look and feel like Java methods. What's different from Java is that this is all by default public. There's no public or private or protected, or of course, obviously no statics. And one of the other things is that these, these parameters appear to have these special flags, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, once you do this, one of the things that Android's ADT or developer tools would automatically do is they will extract from this file a Java class and store it into a gen directory. They, Eclipse uses a command called AIDL, which is built into the SDK, assuming your AIDL file is correct. If it's not, you may not even see errors. It just may not ever create a file. What does this inter now Java class have? Well, this Java class is a proper Java interface, which has the same name as the original file. And it also defines the very same methods that your original interface defined, but now the Java methods. In addition to that, it has internally a stub and a proxy. We'll come back to them and kind of talk about what they do in a, you know, or take a look at the details of what they do in a moment. But they get auto-generated. If your client and or services are using C++, then you don't have an AIDL tool that creates C++ code for you, at least not by default. You have to end up essentially creating your proxies and stubs your own, on your own. Now, what are the types, to come back to your question, so what are the things you can actually put into um, uh, parameters and return values for these methods you define using AIDL? Well, you can obviously pass in any nulls, but that's not a type. You can just pass a null. Um, you can put any primitives and arrays of primitives. You can put char sequences and strings, which are internally passed to C++ as UTF-16. You can pass file descriptors. This is actually what I said er earlier. Key to being able to pass pointers to memory areas or memory structures from one process to another. This is how memory sharing works in Android. One process gets a handle onto some memory block whether it comes from the kernel or it's internally managed, doesn't matter, or it's actually a real file on disk, but it has a file descriptor to it. It can then take that file descriptor, write it into a parcel, via, and send it via essentially the binder channel to the other side. The other side gets the same file descriptor and now has access to the very same resource. The, original, the file descriptor itself is duped, it's copied, but it points to the same OS resource and same position within that resource. You can also pass in any serializable, but that's not very efficient because Java serialization concerns itself with essentially long-term storage as well as to some degree efficiency, whereas Binder is extremely concerned about efficiency. So you should never take essentially a parcel, which is what again is a unit of Binder you know, transactional data, and store it to disk or store it anywhere long-term because it doesn't include enough meta, meta information to be able to, to reread re it properly. So serializables are supported, but not efficient. You should avoid them as much as you can. Maps, so anything of type map can be passed as long as the objects are supported or the values of the maps are of one of the supported types. Same is true for lists and object arrays. So you can put an object array, but they have to be of supported type. You can pass in bundles. Bundles are essentially wrappers for maps. They're just more, they're just glorified. They only allow you to store uh, or put into them one of these supported types. And if any of you guys have used bundles inside of Intent, they'll do the very same bundles. Um, you can also pass in sparse arrays and sparse Boolean arrays, um, but that's kind of just more specialized, essentially, arrays. And finally, well, and finally, two more things you can do. One, you can pass in instances of iBinder. Remember iBinder interface? Anything you pass to the other side is an iBinder reference is not copied, rather it's passed as a Find the reference. So the other side will now have a, essentially a pointer back to that object. That object may might have been your local object, or it might have been an object that you got from somewhere else. But it points to the very same object. 
And finally, if you had custom data types, something that's not on this list, let's say we have a bar, whatever bar may be, then basically what you do is you pass in something, you would need to have your bar implement parcelable, which is like Java serialization or serializable, except that with parcelables, you end up having to implement the strategy for parceling or marshalling and unmarshalling yourself. And so what does that look like? Let's say this bar had some private data, like an integer and a string. And now you implement parcelable. Well, that requires that you implement a mechanism for converting this object into a parcel using the primitives that bind their supports out of the box that I mentioned, as well as the rereading that object from a parcel, meaning updating the object from a parcel, and finally recreating that object from a parcel, which is kind of like reading it. You're essentially creating a brand new object from a parcel. So who will ever call the right to parcel? the proxy. So when this bar needs to be sent to the other side, well, because the binder channel only supports parcels, doesn't know anything about bars, the proxy will convert your bar into a parcel. The other side, on the other hand, the service that wants to say react to a bar, doesn't know anything about parcels, doesn't care about bind parcels, it cares about bars. So what will happen on the other side, the stub will recreate the original bar from a parcel. So essentially, Parcel is a mechanism for you to flatten your object into something that the binder driver can understand. And then these methods are a mechanism of you know, converting them into parcels and recreating them from parcels. I'm not going to go into these details. You can read more about them later. Once you do define, however, any of your custom data types, you're going to have to declare, in, declare them in their own AIDL file and make them parcelable. And one more thing is you end up having to go and import them. This kind of seems redundant for having to import something that's in the same package, but you end up having to do that anyway if you're using custom data types. So that essentially is how you start off creating these these you know, custom types and how you create your, your interfaces. Now, one couple more things I should mention is that parameters in AIDL can take zero or more parameters, but they must return something, even if it's a void. Um, all of them require a directional flag, except primitives, because they're by default in, in only. So what's a directional flag? Well, here in out basically means that this instance of bar will be copied or parceled into the service that it's going to receive it. And then when this call returns, it will be unparceled back, and sorry, reparceled parceled by the other side and unparceled on the client. So basically it will be copied both ways. If you say in, that means it's just copied one way. Or if you say out, it's just copied you know, back to you, but the, your, the, your, the state of the object is never copied towards the service. The integers like this one, you know, because it's a primitive, of course, you, you know, you cannot dereference an integer, and so therefore it's only, it's, you know, only copied, so therefore it's always an in. Um, in terms of the exceptions, you cannot use, um, you cannot use any of the exceptions, well, you, your interfaces cannot throw exceptions, they cannot declare exceptions to be thrown, and if your objects do clear, throw exceptions, those exceptions basically have to be one of these, so security, uh, null pointer, legal argument, and, and that sort, sort of thing. So. Hopefully that made sense for what AIDL is. Now, how does this whole mapping work? Um, this is where it gets slightly tricky. I'm not going to go into too much details other than the fact that you, you, know, you can just trust that it works, but let me kind of give you an idea. So when a client builds an object, that, or sorry, let's say this way. When a service builds an object, right, that, that, become, that we want other clients to be able to use, and he wants to register it with the service manager, at the point where it submits that, that binder object to the service manager, that local reference gets translated into a binder handle. The service manager remembers a pointer, think of it as a pointer back to that original object as, via this binder handle. If a client now requests this binder handle, or you know, because he wants to talk to the service, it gets the very same binder handle. But then that binder handle, when it reaches the client, becomes a local you know, essentially a local address to its own local memory space. When the binder now submits a transaction, the transaction is going to essentially what appears to be a local variable, but the local variable is just a remapped inside of the kernel driver to the remote, the remote handle, which then when it reaches the service, gets a remapped from that remote handle back into the original local object that the service had, the actual service, the object that it wants clients to use. 
So the binder driver automatically essentially rewrites any binder references that you are talking to or any binder references you put into your parameters and or return values. And internally, the binder object main, or sorry, the binder driver maintains a mapping between local references and essentially these virtual or abstract binder handles. You don't have to know that this is happening, except that you benefit from it, because it means that if you share a reference to a, what appears to be a local object to some other process, well, that other process will point, if it submits transactions against that object, it will go to the very same object. Because again, these references are, un are unique across the entire system. Okay. I'm not going to go into internally, it's, you know, the binder driver has like this binary list or binary tree, I should say, of, of these, you know, mapping of references. We don't have to go into how that works. It's not even important except that it does work. Now, let's, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, so let's take a look at, you know, a couple of examples. Let's say you wanted to build an application that you want others to be able to use essentially, or I should say a service, you want others to be able to use. And let's say you're not building a system service, because if you're building a system service, you actually, your job will be slightly easier. Instead, you know, in, if you were building a system service, you could then use the service manager to directly remember the service, you know, the clients want to talk to. But in this case, actually, you won't be able to. Let me give you, and kind of explain what, what this does. In this particular example, we're going to have a client, they'll just have a UI. The UI will collect some sort of an input from the user, the user will click on a button that will generate a request. The request will go from this client activity into a service and from that service into some sort of a library that will act on the request, which will then return the result and essentially the result will go back to the client. That's what the client wants to be able to do. In this case, the request is to calculate, you know, do a Fibonacci calculation and you can specify what sort of, what type of Fibonacci calculation you want, you want to do. Now, because these two things are separated, they can't directly talk to each other. So instead what happens is that the activity that wants to talk to service actually talks to a proxy via lib binder, I should say, goes to the binder driver. This service previously essentially went in here and said, hey, I'm waiting for requests. The actual service didn't do that. The framework took care of it, but the service is essentially waiting for requests. When this request comes in, this thread now wakes up, it gets unblocked, the, re the re request makes its way into the service via stub. The stub takes care of translating the original request, which basically was, you know, in, in, in the process of sending it through binder, converting to these parcels that the service doesn't anything, want to anything, know anything about. The service then goes and gets the request and it does act on the request. The, the, how it acts on the request is not even important because what it does at that point is, is up to the service. So what is the purpose of the stub? To unmarshal the request from the, from the, that receives through, through binder. What is the purpose of the proxy? To marshal the request before it goes to the binder. Now, one particular challenge that we have when we're dealing with application binder services is we need to somehow make those services available to our clients. How do clients find their services? Well, you may think, well, we talked about service manager. Why don't they just register it there? The issue is the service manager only permits registrations from trusted sources. So specifically, it does not allow third-party applications to register themselves with it because if they could, that could lead to all sorts of security implications. So instead, what happens is slightly more kind of roundabout way of registering. Basically, what you end up doing when you're creating a binder service is you end up having to create a normal service, one of those Android component services, whose job is just to provide access to this service. So then how do we, how does this actually, how does the lookup work? Well, the, the way it will work is that the client will submit an asynchronous request to the activity manager to want to bind to remote service. That becomes a binder call to the activity manager service. Again, another binder call, which then uses the package manager to figure out which application actually has the service that we want to bind to. And the package manager somehow figures out that we have it because we map, we somehow register it. And we'll talk about how we register services. I mean, it's simply manifest in the manifest file. At that point, the package manager service goes to this service and says, okay, time to build you. Once the service gets instantiated, this, again, simple service goes and builds an instance of the 
iFibonacci service. That's the one that the client wants to talk to. And then we take this object and we essentially send it back here. So now the client has essentially a remote binder handle onto that object. Seems very convoluted, and it is. Uh, there's, you know, I, I wish I didn't have to draw that many lines on the screen. I know it's, you know, looking for complexity. Yeah, I'm trying to sell you on binder, and yet it doesn't look that easy. But once you get a hang of it once, you know, once you do it, you know, once or twice, it actually becomes very, fairly simple because it's mostly boilerplate code. Now, and that's, by the way, the reason why we have things like Messenger, because they take care of some of that boilerplate code for you. Now, how, would the, how does this all work? So here, I'm, let me kind of give you a couple of ideas. Um, first, when you're creating binder services, one of the first things you want to do is you want to create these common interfaces that will be shared across clients and services. Now, because you want these, these interfaces may contain, you know, custom data types, right? Like we talked about, like say a bar class. Well, because the, this custom data types are going to be used by both service and the client, you generally don't want to copy the code between different projects. So the recommended approach is to use what are known as library projects. So in this case, I would create a Fibonacci common as a, essentially a library project. Fibonacci common would be a very simple, you know, Android project that would just define the interface. In this case, the interface is called the iFibonacci service, AIDL file, and that interface defines five methods. These are fib methods, right? So given some n, give me the Fibonacci of n. And using a couple of different algorithms, this particular class can do calculation using either iterative approach or uh, recursive approach or using Java or using C++, i.e. native. And then there's a custom class or you know, another method called fib, which doesn't take in a simple primitive but takes in a request object and returns a response object. These are custom classes. So here's where we actually have to deal with this parceling business. So what does this custom object look like? By the way, all this code is available in GitHub later should you want to look at it. So don't worry about you know, me skipping over things. So what does this look like? This parcelable, sorry, this request, you know, Fibonacci request may, for example, include two types or two parameters or two pieces of, or two fields, I should say some n that you want to get a Fibonacci of, and some type of the algorithm you want to use, which is just an enum. Well, yes, we could have written this as two different parameters of our binder parcel, but in this case, we wanted to have a single class to kind of encapsulate this request. So we implement parcelable. Once you implement parcelable, you end up having to describe how you write this to a parcel. So here's how we write an integer to or long to a parcel. Here's how we can convert, essentially, for example, a, an enum into a parcel. Right? We write it as an integer. And then on the other side, we need to have a way of recreating that from a parcel. So given a parcel, recreate the original request. So again, we just have to read it in the same order in which we wrote it. Pretty straightforward. Kind of like Java serialization, except you don't get it for free. You end up having to do it yourself. Similarly, here's the Fibonacci response. Fibonacci response basically is all simple and parcelable, has two longs. For example, the result of the, of the Fibonacci operation plus the time it took to perform the operation, say we are interested in for whatever debugging reasons. And again, implements parcel, and again, he has to go and implement a write to parcel and create from parcel, right? So that's essentially like serialization, except it's your, on, on you to do it. Once you do this, basically what will happen next is that the AIDL tool will automatically generate this IP Fibonacci service. So if IP Fibonacci service, again, will include those five methods, but this time it's Java methods. That's it. So that's how you define the common interface. Now you want to implement it, right? So in this case, I build another class or another project called Fibonacci service. What that does, I'm not going to go into details of, you know, how I did it. Let's just focus on the code. That is the actual implementation. That implementation extends from that stub. Remember how we said there's a stub? The stub takes care of the low-level the unmarshalling data. And so what, is this, what do we have to do? We just have to implement the business methods. This is the beauty of, of Binder. You really don't have to worry about, you know, creating any sort of thread or any sort of looping or any sort of selecting. You just implement a bunch of callbacks, the business methods you want others to be able to use. So what does our FibJI look like? Well, we call some library to, to perform the operation. It doesn't even matter what the operation is. You know, what does this look like? Again, we just don't care about it. It's just, we're just implementing the methods. Here's the fib method. This is the one where we're actually reading from a custom object. You know, we're just reading the information from the object as a pure Java object-oriented, you know, programming model. And once we're done, we just return the response. 
This is it. As service developers, as essentially we're creating a binary service right here, we just have to create, you know, work with Java objects. The only, you know, the only thing that gives away that this has anything to do with binder is the fact that we extend from stuff. But other than that, it's pure Java. They're sorry, automatically. They're not threat protected. So they're, this, any of these methods can, in fact, be invoked by multiple concurrent threads. It is up to you in, to, to protect the state. That's what we mentioned previously. So they're not, they're, this, these do not run in a, you know, some, under some sort of a unique lock. In fact, there could be up to 15 concurrent threads talking to you at the same time. Now, how do you actually expose this to the, uh, to the users, to the clients? Well, here's that little service that we built. This is a traditional service that extends a simple service. And all we need to do is that on the method called onBind, or in the method, we just return the service. This is the actual service the client wants to use. Here's the activity manager asking us to give a reference to the service to the client. And we just go and build the service over here, and then we return it. At that point, but only at that point, does the binder driver learn about our service, because our service Right now, on the onCreate is just local. Nobody knows about it except this process. Only when it actually hits the binder channel will the binder driver learn about it and start mapping it. The rest of these methods are already important. They're just here for, you know, so you can kind of debug what's going on. And I'm not going to go into the details of, of how this works. So here's, you, you know, you take your service, you register it. You just register it under a custom intent, right? You just specify an intent filter, I should say, that has a custom action, and now the clients can find it. Now, how do you write a client? Well, the client, again, skipping all the, all the basic stuff, here's some of the UI stuff for the client. I'm not going to go into how that, that's supposed to work. The client is, in this case, it's nothing more than a simple activity. So here's how the client wants to use the service, by its interface. Where does this interface come from? The AIDL tool generated it. The client doesn't even know that this, for the most part, doesn't even know that it's AIDL based. The only thing we'll give it away is one is the fact that it has to deal with with exceptions. You had a question? Yeah, is the client needs to be just the application? No, I mean that's the whole idea. The client, in this case, we want to have it be in a separate application. And the fact that both client and the service can see this common interface is because they share that common library project we per, we, we started with. Okay, so we we end up having three different Android projects. The common library project, which has our, you know, essentially our interface and, and common data types, the service that implements the interface, and the client that wants to use the interface. Right? So now what do we do? So the client wants to use the service. So let's see how the client uses the service. Okay? I'm just going to scroll down to right to that. Here's where the client uses the service. It builds the request, and it then down here, inside of an async task, which you should never go and create async tasks like this, but it's a different, different reason, different point. It goes and says service.fib. Notice how simple this is. It's a simple object-oriented call. The client has no knowledge that this is actually a remote call, except for the fact that the client needs to handle the remote transaction. If the service were to fail, halfway through executing the call, well, it will fail with, the, with an exception. So outside of having to handle this remote exception, you really don't even know this is a binder call. The one thing that does affect, and other than this remote exception, give that away, is the, is, the diff, is the process of binding to the service in, to begin with. So how we use a service is extremely straightforward. We just use it as if it was a local object. We block until the service returns to us. How we find the service is the part that's slightly convoluted. So here's how the client does it in this particular case. In this case, remember, the service is just a local reference, right? Defined by an interface. So how do we initialize it? Well, when the client resumes, it asks the activity manager to bind to the service. We bind to the service by essentially saying, hey, look for some, some service that implements or acts on this intent, and then use it to bind to the actual service we want. Now, when we do this, what we pass to this bind method, we pass in the intent we want to bind to, but we also pass in a reference to, in this case, this. This being a service connection. Essentially, it's an interface that we implement on ourselves, which essentially forces us to have two callback methods, on service connected and on service disconnected. This is how we find out when we connected. Right? So this is an asynchronous call. 
that's the part that's different from binding to system services, which when it comes to system services, you just directly ask the service manager, hey, give me the service and you get it right away. You either get it or it doesn't exist. That's it. And it happens instantaneously. Whereas with this, in this case, you submit a request and then down the road, you receive the service. Now, how do you receive the service? You basically receive a service as an iBinder object. Now, that's all very nice and dandy, but you don't know how to use iBinder objects. This has a wrong type. So what do you do? You essentially ask this stub to give you a proxy over that object. This is where the proxy comes in play. Now, you don't see this as a proxy, but behind the scenes, what this will do is will actually give you a proxy which matches the type you're expecting, which is this type, over the service. What does the proxy do? Remember, the proxy will use this generic object and submit to it generic transactions with parcels. You, on the other hand, you don't want to think in terms of transactions and parcels. You'd want to think in terms of, essentially, method calls with Java objects. So the, how this works, you can take a look at the actual generated code, the, the code that will be generated by IDL, but we don't have to understand it right now. I'm just kind of telling you this is possible. And so that's it. When you want to disconnect, in this case, like for example, in unbind, you simply say, I want to unbind for the same service connection. And at some point in the future, you're going to get a callback that you've disconnected. In this case, you can, for example, make this object be null. This pro you can kill the proxy. It's no, it doesn't even matter. You no longer have reference to it. That's it. And basically, if you were to try to run this, the rest of this is, by the way, just, uh, you know, XML code and whatnot, generic plumbing, so I'm not going to go over it. The, the client looks like this, essentially. In fact, I have it running here. You can come in and say, you know, 43 or 40, say 43 for, oops, for Fibonacci of JI. You hit this, and it will give you the result, and it will tell you what is the overhead of producing the result for transferring over binder, in this case, zero milliseconds. It's actually, binder is extremely efficient. To prove that this is actually happening, you can do, you know, ADB, ADB shell, you know, PS, and you'll actually see that I have two different applications that are talking to each other, right? So the client doesn't have the, the capability of producing Fibonacci results. The service doesn't have the UI, so they're communicating over one another. I can even show you this is happening by showing you how you basically bind the reports, these transactions, but we don't have the time. So, in the last couple of minutes, as we're going to run out of time, I just wanted to mention that Binder also supports what's known as asynchronous motor, motor operation. Asynchronous basically is slightly different. Let me kind of give you a quick overview. Then in this particular case, what you do is you, you create typically a listener so you can receive the response from the client. Um, and as opposed to re getting the response in the original request, so you submit a FIB request and you get a FIB response, you basically create an interface that will have a callback with the response. Now, our original Fibonacci service interface, now, as opposed to returning something, it returns nothing, but it takes in your listener. So what makes this one-way or asynchronous is this one keyword called one-way. This keyword essentially becomes a flag that tells the binder driver that the client doesn't want to wait for the response because there's nothing to wait for. It's void anyways you basically re immediately return from the call. What happens is that when the response is finally produced by the client, the service, the service will send the response via this listener. So here's what the service will now look like. So just let me just show you. Service basically has a fib method, which now returns void, but takes in a listener. This listener is implemented by or defined by an interface, again, a Java interface. What the service doesn't know that this listener is now a proxy to the actual listener that lives in the client. So how does the service use it? It just goes and calls, listener, here's your response. And it sends the response back, right? It doesn't return, it usually just do a return, now it sends it back via a callback. The benefit is that the client didn't wait for the service while this was happening. The client, you know, the client could have done the submission on its UI thread or the looper thread without having to kind of use async binder, or async task or anything like that. Now, the, the binder, the one thing, one challenge when, that you have to deal with when you're using listeners, or I should say asynchronous binder, is when these calls come back to you through binder, or any calls that come back to you through binder, they actually come back to you over a binder thread, not on one of your UI threads. So what does that mean? If the client were to try to react on the listener callback 
and update the UI to, to display how much basically uh, uh, you know the, the response it would fail because as you know in Android the non UI threads cannot touch the UI so what is the challenge well, how do you resolve that challenge well typically what you do is in your listener you don't update the UI but rather you create a message and then you use a handler to drop that message the actual response you got onto a handler which then Cast puts that message on, their, on the message queue, the UI thread picks up that message sometimes in the future and then reacts to it and it can then update the UI. If you don't know about message queues and handlers, unfortunately we don't have the time to go over it, but I'm just kind of, you know, ask you to look at the code yourself. Um, in terms of, I'm just gonna wrap this up in the next two minutes, if you don't mind sticking around for that long. Um, sharing memory, there's, um, not, there's no built-in mechanism for sharing large memory buffers in Java in, uh, through Binder. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot send through binder transactions more than one meg of data. So you cannot just take a giant blob of data and just send it across. So you, unfortunately, you have to basically resort to memory sharing, but that's only available in C++. How you do this is through something called ashmem, which essentially gives you file descriptors over memory regions that you can share. I'm not going to go into details. You can look at it on your own. In terms of limitations, uh, I already mentioned there's only up to 15 threads per process and only up to one meg in for the, any concurrent transactions you have between you know, a client and a, and a driver. Um, in terms of security, I'm not gonna go into the details. I, I do invite you to look at this later, but basically, Binder doesn't directly secure anything, but one of the things that it does enable is that it provides the information about the sender to the receiver. The receiver can then use the information about the sender to determine whether the sender has the right set of permissions to make that call. And most of Android security is enforced this way. So Binder doesn't enforce security, but it provides information which is of critical importance for enforcing the security. This kind of shows you how that works, the code down below. Um, this actually gives you the whole permissions, how you would go and make your, say, services uh, secure. And I'm not gonna go into the details of it, I'm just gonna ask you to look at it yourself on your own. In terms of other features, there's the death notification mechanism, which is also very interesting. You can kind of take a look at how, how it's used, as well as a reporting that's built into, into Binder. Um, that's about it. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. I apologize, we had to rush through a lot of things. There are a lot of additional resources, if you're interested, that you can uh, look at. A lot of these have to do with internals. And then Android's own documentation has guides on how you can use it in the application space. Uh, the video from this, as well as the slides, will be posted at our URL. And if you have any questions, I'll be here for a couple of more minutes. And actually, I'll be leaving, and then we can talk as I leave outside. So thank you, guys.